You know, the two genres of film that often get undermined through a critical lens are the horror genre and the science fiction genre. The Oscars is an event everybody is familiar with at this point. They've been around since 1928, six years away from its 100 year anniversary. Can you believe that? A hundred years of awful takes. <laughs> Still though, I'd argue they're at least better than the Grammys. I mean, seriously, Taylor Swift beating to Pepper Butterfly. I am not even gonna get into it. Taylor Swift. While the Oscars always tries to be this grand and prestigious spectacle every year, ask anyone on the street what they think of the Oscars, and you'll find most people aren't too keen with their choices in film. I mean, the best movies tend to get overlooked, and believe me, that goes double for the horror and science fiction department. If you're a fan of horror or science fiction in any capacity, you can pretty much only hope your favorite movie wins best picture in its respective genre, because it sure as isn't winning picture of the year. In the entire history of the Oscars, only six horror films have been nominated for best picture. And can you take a guess of how many horror movies or science fiction movies have actually won best picture? I mean, seriously, take a wild guess. One. The only horror movie to ever win the award for best picture was Silence of the Lambs in 1991. And there's never been a single science fiction film that has ever won best picture. As sad as it is to see, Countless great horror films and science fiction films are overlooked, and that leads us to an interesting situation with Ridley Scott's 1979 classic, Alien. Alien is a science fiction horror film about a hostile alien that starts picking off the crew members one by one. A simple premise, but executed masterfully. You know, the film industry is kind of like a moody teenager. It is always going through phases. Audiences tend to be fickle and it's really hard to know what will land with people. Sometimes it's goofy Adam Sandler movies that are in, sometimes it's crime dramas that are all the rage. Or if you live in the cursed timeline of 2022, you'll find a new superhero movie comes out every five minutes. I mean seriously, who are half these people? Can, can someone tell me? I, I don't know who they are. Well. As far as science fiction goes, there were only two brief moments in time where science fiction actually hogged the spotlight. The first time was in the 50s, with the rise of science fiction horror films like The Thing from Another World, The Body Snatchers, and Forbidden Planet. The second time was in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. Now, the success of science fiction movies in the 1970s was single-handedly carried by one film and one film only. I think most of you are familiar with it by now, and that is the one and only Starship Invasions. Enemy. Nah, I'm only kidding. It was, of course, Star Wars. With the overwhelming popularity of Star Wars in 1977, this paved the way for great science fiction films like The Fly and John Carpenter's remake of The Thing. While these films can be considered classics in their own right, Alien stands as one of the most effective and eerie films ever created. The script for Alien had been floating around Hollywood for some time and although many directors got asked to direct the film, many turned down the offer. Ridley Scott was actually the fifth person asked to direct the film because the top four choices were all uninterested in making a f ton of money. And thank God they were so virtuous because I can't imagine anyone but Scott as director for this film. In fact, if this movie was directed by someone else, I probably wouldn't be making this video right now as I genuinely feel anyone else would have wasted this movie's true potential. On that note, it is also worth mentioning the writer for the film as well, Dan O'Bannon. O'Bannon managed to write science fiction in a way that was easy for general audiences to understand. In preparation for this video, I checked out what other creators pointed out about the film, and I think James Rolfe captured my issue with writing in science fiction movies perfectly. The characters are very convincing. Usually in these science fiction movies, the people who fly ships are super intelligent, speaking a lot of high-tech jargon, 
But here, they're just common working people. Flying a ship is just like driving a truck. That's how far into the future we are. Science fiction movies are notorious for over-explaining details that are better left unexplained. When movies over-explain, not only is it boring, it usually leaves the audience feeling out of the loop as all the technical language just fails to click in the viewer's mind since it's all technology that is so unfamiliar and abstract to us. In Alien, O'Bannon's writing is always straight to the point and doesn't trip over itself trying to communicate unnecessary details about space travel or something like that. Audiences generally don't care about how the mechanics of a spaceship works. We just want to see the damn thing fly and shoot lasers. Uh, temperature, temperature to a hundredth of a centigrade, actually. Don't care. Uh, an electric grid to a fraction of a millivolt. Don't care. Uh, magnetic, electromagnetic. Still don't care. On, on the quantum level, we have uh, we've constructed an entire... I don't care. O'Bannon clearly understands what is worth including and what isn't, and the dialogue is very organic. Along those lines, Ridley envisioned the script and characters with great detail. There's seven characters altogether. Dallas, Lambert, Brett, Kane, Ash, Parker, and of course, Ripley. The casting and the wardrobe did such a great job with all these characters. The other day, my friend and I talked for like five minutes about how cool Ripley looks. I mean, she's got Converse in space. How awesome is that? The design of the alien is also inspired and cool. The design was largely based on art by Swiss surrealist H.R. Geiger. Some other notable inspirations included images of deep sea creatures, spiders, and other animals. The monster comes in various forms throughout the movie, perhaps none being as iconic as the facehugger. When I first saw the facehugger, I thought of it as a spider and a snake merging into one awful creation. It caught me entirely off guard and I literally said to myself out loud, As the film progresses, the alien grows in stature and becomes darker as well. As the situation becomes more dire, less and less of the monster is seen. As the audience, we only really see bits and pieces of him within the frame at a certain time, mainly due to Scott's usage of extreme close-ups. This makes the audience's imagination go off, as we never really get to get a clear idea of what the monster looks like. This was a clear directorial decision from Scott, which resulted in a very claustrophobic film overall. One thing I admire about the film is how Scott shot a lot of the scenes with a lot of activity going on to give the film a really close quarters feel. As an example, the dinner scene is designed to make you feel like you're part of the table sharing a meal with the team. The shot positions the characters in a neutral and fixed manner, much as if you were in the seat right next to them. Scott also takes a second to quote unquote check in with each character, showing the POV of the table from many different angles and not just for those that are talking. And then that leads me to another thing that can be praised about Scott's directing, his patience. For the first 25 minutes or so, nothing really happens with the movie. Some might even mistake it for a sci-fi movie with no horror elements. But this slow burn makes the impact of seeing the facehugger that much more terrifying. The film makes the viewer really wait for the payoff, and it makes it well worth it. Audiences have been so accustomed to certain audio or visual cues that spoil the scare of many horror movies, or even worse, just build up to a cheap jump scare. But with Alien, you're in good hands. There's never any clear signs of when the monster will strike, and the movie feels really unpredictable and realistic in how the situation will play out. The central themes of the movie, survival, technology, femininity, and morality, all work in complete harmony with one another. They're all interconnected to each other in some capacity and woven together so well. Technology, for example, plays such a key role in the movie, and it is vital to understanding what makes Alien work. Though the characters are light years ahead of us, they are still human and have their limitations. Technology is of great use in the film, but it also fails them in dealing with the alien, and in some cases, even becoming as big a threat as the alien itself. Around halfway through the movie, it is revealed that Ash, the science officer, is an android programmed by the company to ensure the alien is brought back alive so they can use it as a weapon. They were more than fine throwing away the lives of their employees to gain an upper hand against whatever opponents they may have. A short-sighted and ruthless plan. In this regard, technology acts as a secondary villain to the heroes, which is interesting in its own right. Technology is not an inherently good or evil thing. It boils down to how people use it. I think Ben Parker's words of wisdom ring true here. With great power comes great responsibility. 
The company Nostromo has the power to use this technology for good, but instead focuses on how they can have the upper hand in warfare. It is not all that different from how countries are more than fine compromising the safety and privacy of their own citizens just to keep an advantage on the enemy. Then was reasonable or responsible. They were totally willing uh, to destroy somebody's life. Uh, just on the off chance, they would get some information that, that wouldn't even be uh, uh, tremendously valuable. In many ways, Alien was truly ahead of its time in recognizing the exploitation of average working people. This goes hand in hand with how the film approaches. Alien offers two main views on morality that are expressed through the human characters on one side and the alien and technology on the other. Morality is hard to talk about since it's subjective from place to place and era to era. Hell, most of us can't even agree if pineapple belongs on pizza. So never mind issues dealing with laws or morality. While the movie is pretty open-ended in its depiction of morality, one of the most telling scenes of the movie comes from when Ash, the android, expresses how he admires the alien. From the human point of view, we would certainly consider the alien a hostile and evil creature, but Ash, on the other hand, comments on how the alien, like us, simply wants to live. I admire its purity, a survivor. I am clouded by conscience, remorse, or delusions of morality. The only difference between the alien and the humans is that it is unbothered by conscious and simply does as it needs to, without any second thoughts. In more day-to-day -day terms, I don't think most people would consider a cat evil for killing a mouse. I mean, sure, we wouldn't like it, but I don't think we'd call our cat evil. A cat isn't capable of doing such a thing in a malicious or premeditated way. It simply does so for survival. In much the same way, the film presents a creature that just wants to live and reproduce, like all animals. The humans and the alien carry the same goal throughout the entire movie, survival, which is where the central conflict of the movie comes from, as they are both just trying to do what they have to do to survive. So from the alien's point of view, where are the monster getting in the way of its livelihood? This is reminiscent of themes presented in the novel I Am Legend. In I Am Legend, we consider the doctor to be the protagonist and the hero of the story as he's simply trying to help out the people that are affected with this virus. From the infected people's point of view, the doctor is the bad guy He's capturing them, kidnapping them essentially, to perform all kinds of weird experiments and kill countless of them. So it really makes you wonder who is truly in the right? Is anyone in the right? Or what's going on? You know, it's a very interesting question. There's one thing I haven't gotten the chance to talk about yet, but if there's one word that can describe this crew, it's competent. A lot of horror movies don't work because the characters put themselves in situations that most of us wouldn't. It's addressed in movies like Scream that satirize all the holes in the horror movies, but Alien contrasts the usual tropes of horror movie characters and writes all of its characters to be completely capable and intelligent. Instead of short-sighted teenagers, Alien offers us scientists and engineers. Almost nothing the crew does is outright stupid. They make logical decisions based on the situations they find themselves in. Even when Kane gets brought back into the ship, we assume this was done out of empathy at that point. So even that I wouldn't consider a dumb thing to do. The movie communicates that smart people can still find themselves in horrifying situations. And if anything, this amplifies the horror because we know they're reliable people that are trying their hardest to stay one step ahead of the alien. Yet they still fail. It's pretty dark. In the event of a hostile creature hunting you down, it doesn't matter if you're Einstein, Tesla, you're still bound to the same fate the crew suffered. All of the crew, but one. All right, here's two pieces of trivia I think everyone knows by now. Ripley was supposed to be a male character originally, but because the script was written in unisex, any character you see in the movie could have had their gender flipped. Director Ridley Scott was asked why Ripley couldn't be a woman, and after some thought, he came around to the idea and liked it. Sigourney Weaver was cast as Ripley, and she blew it out of the park. Alien was her first feature film, as she was a Broadway actor before then. Despite this being her first film, She's the star of the show, and she offers an incredible performance. It's even more impressive considering the context of her role. Ripley was actually the first woman lead in the genre, and now she's iconic for her representation of women. It blows my mind how good her character was written. 
Once again, O'Bannon and Scott did the character justice and emphasized the importance of showing, not telling. The one thing that I admire most about how Ripley was presented in this movie is that she just is. Scott and O'Bannon recognize that it's completely irrelevant for the film to comment on Ripley being a woman, and that's because it doesn't need to. I'm not trying to say that other movies can't do this. Certainly there's a time and place to comment on women and topics about women, but Scott lets the film run its natural course instead of bombarding the audience. Again, I have no issues with film with women leads or films that address topics about women, but as a student of film, what I value most is how the movie is written and presented to the audience. If a character is written shitty, they're written shitty. Male, female, non-binary. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. Have you ever seen me without this stupid hat on? That's weird. In Alien, there is none of that business. The movie is as blunt as Ripley herself. The audience can see how tough she is for themselves, and they can see characters like Ash disrespect her authority. There is no need for any characters to comment on how tough Ripley is, because we can see it. Could you open the goddamn hatch? We have to get him inside. No. I can't do that, and if you were in my position, you'd do the same. Ripley, this is in order. Open that hatch right now, do you hear me? Yes. Ripley, this is in order! Do you hear me? Yes. I read you. The answer is negative. Ripley carries herself all the way to the very end of the movie, always using her own wits to get out of harm's way. She always addresses the crew with complete confidence and she has very little self-doubt, if any. In short, she is completely sure of herself. Now I know I mentioned that the script was written in unisex, so I understand many of you might be thinking that undermines her character's writing. And while I can see where you're coming from, I disagree. Ridley Scott could have easily changed some lines to the film if he wanted to. It's common for Hollywood directors to change lines all the time. Or he could have given her character a completely different direction, but Scott let Weaver perform the role as cool as it was meant to be. I feel a lot of people think writing is everything in film, they treat the script like the Bible, but that couldn't be further from the truth. An actor is capable of saying the same line over a thousand different ways. It's the performance and the rest of the film that bring that script to life. It's the reason people make tier lists of who played the best version of the same character. The energy the actor brings to the role is crucial in how audiences perceive the character, and it's the director's job to bring out that performance. Ultimately, Ripley is a tough character that is able to stay composed in the most frightening situations. Nearly 50 years after its release, and the film still gets praised for its expression of feminism on the big screen. Alien is an awesome movie. I saw it for the first time only a couple weeks ago. I was originally going to make this video about A Nightmare on Elm Street, but I loved this movie so much that I said to hell with that. Maybe some other day, but I just had to talk about Alien first. Although the movie is set far off in the future, this movie is truly timeless. It always remains relevant because it covers universal themes that have been around since we were cavemen. I mean, whether it's running from a saber-toothed tiger or hiding from a hostile alien, humans will always have to fend off against unfriendly creatures. This movie is a masterclass in balancing two genres that are hard enough to pull off on their own, let alone covering both of them. It's as much sci-fi as it is horror, and on top of that, it is beautiful throughout. It's aged like fine wine. I mean, come on, the aliens look real. They look like living, breathing organisms. It's incredible to me that with less technology, they made aliens more realistic than whatever the hell this guy is. I mean, come on, why the hell are they rendered so poorly? They look like holograms. <laughs> All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's a topic for another day, but Alien is a classic. I'm loving this movie, loving this movie. I'm feeling a light nine to a 10 on this thing. Transition. Special thank you to James Young, Brad B, Christian Bradley, and Avery Lake. Thank you so much for supporting my channel.